Hello everybody, Dr. Mandis here, coming to you today talking about atomic theory. It's kind of intimidating, atomic theory, but not really atomic theory, just, you know, hey, how has the whole like, notion of an atom evolved over the past few uh, millennia, all right? So, I mean, I just want to ask a simple question that was first posed to me during a water break at a football practice in high school by one of my coaches. How can you have a drink of water and make it last forever? Not that you're going to add to it. Just this little sample of water here. You know, just some water. You drink it. Make it last forever. Easy answer that Coach Petruniak used to tell us. You drink half. If you drink half, you always have half left. But I don't have the power. No, whatever superpowers you need, you're always going to just have half left. And you can picture, like I can picture like old ancient philosophers pondering this question. You know, and it has been in different civilizations from the Indian, from what was it, Canada and India to Democritus and Greece and Democritus is who we're going to give credit for. A lot of ancient cultures ponder this whole idea of, do you have a continuous theory of matter, meaning you just keep cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, and always have half left? Or at some point, discontinuous theory of matter, do you run into some fundamental particle? It's a Tomos and the atom, and I know water is a molecule, but you get this whole idea the molecule would be the fundamental particle. At some point, you only have one molecule of water left. At that point, you can't cut in half anymore and still have water. So we know in the 21st century that the discontinuous theory of matter, at least as far as all our theories go, is what holds sway. This was brought up by John Dalton in 1803. I have here a little tiny circle showing like the sphere. I'm, writing, I'm drawing in 2D. It's 3D. I mean, if you think about it, you could stack cubes, like blocks, better and make matter out of it. But if you have a block, the forces aren't all aligned equally because the corners would have more than everybody else. But in a sphere, if you think the forces of whatever that fundamental particle is uh, universally spread out throughout the particle, then it would be a sphere. So you have these spheres that are full of mass because everything has mass, okay? And that's what he said. And he said, like, hey, all the atoms of every element would be the same. And so I said, you know, cake is cake. Yeah, pieces of whatever are what, the same. Makes sense. Okay, carbon's carbon, lead's lead. But we know that's not true. We know about isotopes. So that part of his theory wasn't true. Okay, not all the atoms of all substances are the same. We also know that the atom's not the smallest part. It's the smallest part that retains the properties of that element but not necessarily the smallest part because we know about, you know, quarks, electrons, protons, neutrons, things that subatomic particles. So that's not true either. And we also know that you can split the atom because we live in a nuclear age. So that wasn't true either. So why does John Dalton get credit as the first modern atomic theory? Because it was a good theory. And that's the nature of theories and the nature of science. And it's good to know that. Theories change based upon experimental evidence. And you just keep, they keep growing like a tomato plant, you know, it just keeps growing. So in 1803, we have John Dalton talking about atoms. By the end of the century, we have J.J. Thompson. Three years in, we get John Dalton. Three years till the end, 1897, J.J. Thompson discovers the electron. We knew about electricity, you know, Ben Franklin, the kite, and all that jazz. But what fundamental particle makes up electricity? That's the electron. And electrons are in atoms. Alrighty, so three years into the next century, I don't know why we're going by threes, but we are, 1903, Thompson comes up with what we call the plum pudding model. And basically said, look, if the atom is full of mass, then the mass must be positive because electrons are negative. And so you had these little electrons, those are the little dashes I drew in there. Those little dashes represent the electrons. The electrons are in the pudding, okay? They're the fruit that's in the pudding. They're of the plum pudding model of the atom. And that holds sway for a while. but only a year later. A year later, we get Antara Nagaoka over in Japan, who didn't do any real experimentation with it, but just had the idea that, hey, if electrons are highly mobile, such that, you know, you know, just think about it on a dry winter day or any day where you can get a shock. You know, you rub your feet on the carpet, touch something, that's a shock. Those are electrons moving. So the electrons aren't buried within the atom. They got to be accessible. And so Antara Nagaoka just moved them onto the outside and made like a, think of it as a Saturnian model, a ring of electrons surrounding this mass, a uh, positive mass, okay? And the mass wasn't individual particles, they were just a, a mass, like a pudding, okay? You can't have a piece of pudding, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, you have 
Ernest Rutherford. He was working underneath J.J. Thompson. He, what, when he got on his own, what he was investigating was shooting radiation at metal pieces because radiation was new. Thank you, Marie Curie and husband. Uh, but trying to see how far they penetrate. So he got really, really, really thin pieces of metal and was shooting elect, uh, radioactive particles at it. He was shooting alpha particles. The metal that he picked was gold because gold doesn't oxidize. It wasn't fancy, but so it stays pure. Like if it was silver, you'd have silver oxide and that would not be silver anymore. The cool thing about gold, it doesn't oxidize. So anyway, you're shooting these big alpha particles at this gold foil and he thought, you know, the alpha particles should just fly through that pudding. Okay. But they didn't. Okay. Here's what he had. He had this groovy little detector and the detector, this thing bears mention. Okay. Not detector, the emitter. Okay. He basically made a ray gun. You put, and it's not hard. You put an alpha emitter inside a box, nothing's going to get out, but a lead box. Instead of the lead, put a little slit there. Okay. And you make kind of like a barrel. So as the particles bounce around in there, if they get the right trajectory, they can go out. And that's what he did. He used a source of radium as your alpha emitter source and basically shot these little, what I drew as red dots, at the gold foil. They should have just blown right through the gold foil if they were going to penetrate, if it was thin enough, and pop out here on the screen. The screen is like zinc sulfide, I think. Don't quote me on that. And basically it fluoresces, though, enough particles hit it. So turn off the lights and just count the fluoresces, and you can see how many particles are going through. And what he saw, though, wasn't everything coming through here. He saw a bunch coming through. But he also saw deflections off to the side and some of them going straight freaking back, right back. All right. He, the quote he said is it's like shooting a 12 inch shell on a piece of tissue paper, an artillery shell at a piece of tissue paper and it bouncing off the tissue paper. Not really what you'd expect. So he had to come up with a different idea of what the atom was. And so he said, well, look, if we have this tiny little nucleus in there, that's the little gold dots, gold for gold. Okay. Little nucleus with the mass. And the electrons, we'll talk about more of this in a second, the electrons being in this electron cloud, this empty space, then if you get rid of the electron clouds here, if you get rid of them because they're just empty space, and we focus on this, you basically have these tiny packets of mass spread out. They'd be very diffuse. And so when the alpha particle goes through, odds are it's going through empty space, nothing happens to it. But if it happens to hit one dead on, now that, all that mass being concentrated in one spot, all that positive mass, the positive alpha particle, they're going to, boom, reflect right off of it and shoot back. So you had an explanation of what he saw. What about the guys to the side? Well, if the alpha particle didn't hit it dead on, but kind of kind of near miss, so to speak, there'd still be a repulsion of those positive fields, and it would push it off like a Plinko chip off to the side. Okay. So the cool, the cool thing about our things is we went from, the sphere, now we're going down to a sphere of empty space. The nucleus is really small. People dig that. They, you say, okay, it's really small. But I want you to think about it for 30 seconds. I won't add more time to this video than that. But what I want you to picture is a professional sports stadium. Okay, think of the amount of space that you would have. Empty it out, but just keep the space. In the middle of that space, you're going to put a little marble or like a pea or something. Say marble, a little guy right there. Float in the middle. That's your nucleus. The rest of the space is the electron cloud. Now, the nucleus, one electron is going to be like one ten thousandth the size of that little marble. Okay, so picture you and your buddies to get 12 of your closest friends, shrink yourself down and hook up with Miss Frizzle on the bus, on the school bus, magic school bus, hook up with her, shrink down to one ten thousandth the size of that marble with a jet pack and start whipping around this empty space of the stadium. There's no way you'd fill the stadium. Okay, so most of the stadium would be empty space and that is matter. All matter is made of atoms and over 99% of it is nothing. Okay, so that means everything around you, touch your leg, touch your pencil, everything is nothing. Okay, it's just empty space. What happens is you have repulsions of those negative electron clouds that repulse each other, and that's what you're kind of feeling. So actually think about this. The chair you're sitting on, you're not really on it. You're repulsed and are levitating just a little bit above it. Kind of cool. Anyway, so you get Rutherford who said, little nucleus, big electron cloud. But there's more. There's more to it. It's well known that stars give off a spectrum, okay? And each element has spectrum. And 
you kind of know what I'm talking about if you've ever seen neon lights. All right, fill a glass tube with a gas, shoot electricity through it, and it will glow a certain color. Okay, if it's hydrogen, you get this spectrum here. Okay, you have certain wavelengths of light. It's kind of, you know what a spectrum is because if you've ever seen a rainbow, same idea. All white light, you see all the spectrum. But if the light is just the light being emitted from hydrogen, okay, and we'll do this later on in another video. But if it's just light from hydrogen, you see a purple, a purple, whatever color that is. I only do Crayola Apex, that bluish thing, and red. Those are the only things of our prism, of our rainbow. So you get really discrete wavelengths. Okay, discrete wavelengths, wavelength is lambda, that's proportional to an amount of energy. So you're only getting definite, definite little amounts of energy. And this comes out of the work of Max Planck, who said that energy is quantized. And so we're seeing that because we're seeing set patterns of energy. And so what Niels Bohr said is, well, the electrons, if you have this little nucleus and this big electron cloud, they're not anywhere within the cloud. They're at set levels of energy. And as they move between those set levels, levels of energy, they emit the extra. It's kind of like be in the third floor of a building magically go from the third floor down to the second. At the third floor, you had some amount of potential energy because you were so far from the ground. At the second floor, you're going to have less. That difference in energy is what would have to be emitted, given up. So the electron up in the third floor, magically it boom, pops into the second floor. The difference in energy has to be emitted. We see that as light. Okay, that's why things glow in the dark. Okay. And so what Bohr decided was, hey, that's that Bohr model down here. You have discrete little levels of energy, he called them orbits, around the nucleus where the electrons are. They're never in between. They're either in one orbit or the next. And it worked really well. It's totally explained the hydrogen atom with one electron. Didn't work so well with multiple electrons. Sucks. Well, in the 20s, you had Erwin Schrodinger, Vernon Heisenberg, a lot of other people doing a lot of good work with orbitals and developing this quantum mechanical model of the atom which we will get to in the next video on orbitals, and they refine it. We still like this whole idea of energy levels because it's a better pictogram of things. All right, the Bohr model is where we sort of are stuck, but we know it doesn't work. There's a quantum mechanical model, which we'll explore, which is another video. All righty. So basically what we want to wrap up with is you definitely have a nucleus. You have an electron cloud. It's like the entire building, but we're going to need to cut that building up into parts, the orbitals. And all of that is still true as far as our theory holds today. Alrighty. You do have subatomic particles that we know of. They have the electrons, protons, neutrons, electrons negative, protons positive. Neutrons weren't discovered up until the 30s. Neutrons would be hard to find, man, okay? Because there's, they're neutral. It's like finding the planet next to the bright star. What do you look at? There's nothing to see. You have to infer their ability, okay? But... They're there. The masses, we say electrons are zero, but really they're about one ten thousandth of the electron of the proton neutron, which is kind of like belly button lint versus you. I mean, not a whole lot. Alrighty. Protons and neutrons are made out of quarks, which is something not germane to this discussion. But electrons are electrons are just a, a fundamental particle. Anyway, hope you learned a little bit about atomic theory through the ages. Have a great day. Take care.